All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm joined by Robert Jake Jacobs, who is up in Toledo, Ohio. How are you doing, Jake? I'm great, John. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And and Jake is the author of a number of books. Um, some of the books uh, which I can mention here is Real Time Strategic Change. You don't have to do it alone. And today what we wanted to talk about was the subject of real work in real time with real results. So, Jake, tell me about what you mean by, let's start with what do you mean by real work? Well, real work, a lot of times, John, when people, I'm, I'm in the business of change, mm -hmm. and I say fast and lasting results is, is my tagline. So a lot of times when people are going through a change effort, um, they separate change work from real work. Mm. And it's um, and, and then they finish the change work at some point. So that change effort's over. My worldview on that is different. I believe that if you can make change work part of real work and real work part of change work, then it all just becomes your day job. And change isn't something special. It's not something unusual. It's not something off to the side on Friday. I'm on a steering group for that. Um, or a special team. It, it is part of the core fabric, the DNA of every organization. And I've said that changeability, the ability for an organization to change is the greatest single competitive advantage that any business can have. And so that's it. And, and I agree. But I mean, I think it's an interesting point you raise. I and mean, let's dissect it a, a couple of ways here. Because it seems to me I, I have this weird, this weird phenomenon takes place where in our real lives or private lives or personal lives, right? Change is constant, like we're constantly, you know, somebody gets ill, something happens, an expense comes or whatever. There's always in flux, right? But when we come into work, we try and keep everything exactly the same and have it so predictable. And it's like, it's like we almost think that we can separate the reality of life from the reality of work, right? Yes, well, I would say... Um, in my own experience and, and in those of uh, people that I that I know and love, um, they actually try and keep everything the same in their personal <laughs> lives to some extent as well, because it's easier that way. There, there's some of us, I'm very focused on professional development, learning, lifelong learning. So so change is a part of that. But I think as, as human beings, we are uh, wired for uh, comfort and comfort for most people comes from stability. And so stability is the opposite pole. It is the opposite of change. And if there's not enough uh, change in the world, uh, then we need more stability. Not enough stability, we need more change. So when we come into work, it, you know, some people see that as a refuge. They, they've been doing the same thing for a number of years. Like I said, change in business and organizations is a special event. Mm -hmm. It's not a daily event. Right. And we're in life, change is a daily event. We're faced with changes every day. And you would think that everybody becomes an expert in it because mm -hmm. they live it every day. But I think the issue is, is that in work, in business, predictability gets rewarded. Um, profits and, uh, you know, the quarterly results being good every month every quarter, that's what it's about. So when we look and we say, well, what's the odd thing about business and organizations? I think it comes from expectations. Mm -hmm. And people have expectations for things to stay the same because they know how to do their job. They know what their work is. They know what the business is about. And then somebody like me comes in and works with senior executives and turns the whole thing upside down. But by turning it upside down, what I think is in the long run, you become more competitive, more innovative, and more successful. Yeah, and it's interesting, in, and you say that because uh, I mean the, the the pace of innovation and business change and everything is is pretty uh, amazingly rapid these days, right? You know, maybe it's always been fast, but it just seems it seems to be faster. And business models get turned on their heads constantly, and. You know, what I always say to people is don't get married to your projects, right? Because there's nothing, you know, as you know, and you probably face this constantly with being, a, being, you know, doing change management is if somebody is invested or a team has invested a lot of time in something and a business reality changes or a strategic imperative comes in where you go, 
I'm sorry guys, I know you put all this effort in, but now I need you to focus over here. That's tough. So how do you handle that with people? Because people really find that tough. Right. So, I mean, I smile because there's a man in our field, my field, Peter Block, who uh, has said, don't fall in love with your methodology. Mm -hmm. So don't get married to your project. Don't fall in love with your methodology. There's there's a lot of emotion tied up in what we're talking about. But on a serious note, there is a lot of emotion. People do get invested in. And, you know, the best thing that you could hope for in an organization is people's time, commitment and desire for that business to succeed. And so, like you're saying, it shows up in a particular project. It's those people who are so invested, in my experience, that are the best change agents in the organization because they're the most committed, um, they are the uh, most desirous of success, and to get involved in a project, almost every project that somebody gets involved in involves change. Mm -hmm. So they already have a leg up on that. And so if, in fact, you take a look, I mean, there, there may be some reticence in saying, Well, you know, we've gotten this far on it, but I think that most people want to win. They want to win personally. They want their teams to win. They want their projects to win. They want their businesses to win. And so what I do is I come from a place that's called what's your preferred future? Mm. And a collective preferred future is something that everybody has their voice heard in creating and everybody has their actions involved in making it real. And so finding that common preferred future means that my project is just piece of a much larger puzzle. And, you know, what I need to do to make my project successful, well, what's the project that needs to be successful? And then how do I invest in that one? So then uh, a lot of the issues that people have really come around, come from how things are communicated or how the vision is presented maybe by the leadership. And obviously that's where you do a lot of work because um, when you have to go through changes or a lot of changes or constant changes and it happens in business a lot, the, the grumble that you always get is, oh, they're changing things again. They don't know what they're doing, all of that. And that comes from a lack of communication and alignment around what you call the preferred future, right? Right. And I would say there's another really important word, which is engagement. Mm -hmm. And so the kind of work that I do is how do we engage people and having their voices heard in creating their collective future? And so I had a project we're working on now where we've had uh, five global summits. And these summits are large group meetings of 150, 200 people that are a cross section of the organization, representative of the organization. And they come together. And part of what they did is that the executives came up with a draft of their purpose for the organization, their values and behaviors for the organization. Um, They looked and said, what is a picture of success for us in the future? And they presented these at each of the five global summits and said, what do you think? Did we get it? Are there things that are missing? Are there things that are really important to you? And they got feedback on these. And then we had an action summit that had representatives from each of these five global summits come together to represent their person, their voice from their summit and say, in this action summit, how do we craft the details of how we make this real day to day? And before that action summit, the leaders got the feedback from all of these global summits and then they nailed down and said, okay, this is what the people are saying. This is what we believe, which is attention, mm-hmm. right? It's not just do what the people say. It's not just do mm-hmm. what we say, but it really is a conversation. And what we did is we had a conversation with several thousand people to come up with what the answer was for the, those three questions around the purpose, the picture of success, and the values and behavior. And what we're doing right now is saying, all right, how do we make this real day-to-day throughout a 38,000 member organization. But it's a different paradigm. It's a different approach that says everybody needs to have their voice heard. Everybody needs to have their fingerprint on that piece of clay that is the future of the organization. So how do you how do you keep that uh, contained, I guess, in some way? Because at some stage, right, you have to bring these things to a close. At some stage, you know, you have to you have to move forward. So how do you how do you strike that balance of having letting people have have their voices heard and having input, but at the same time, 
making a decision and moving forward and executing the change. And let's face it, not everybody's going to agree with the outcome, are they? Right. So another really important word, I think, is expectations. Mm -hmm. And if I know what to expect as a member of the organization, it's much easier to accept it. So we work with a design team, which is another microcosm of the whole organization to lead the effort. And when I say to lead the effort, this is not um, a rubber stamp committee. Mm -hmm. These are people who are actually making decisions that said we should have five global summits. We should have this action summit. They help us plan the agenda for each of these meetings. And so we had a roadmap that laid out five phases very clearly. It said what was going to happen in each phase. We communicated that roadmap. And my experience is that people have been grateful. They have been excited. They have been energized by knowing that their colleagues and that they themselves have shaped this future, which it's so unusual in businesses and in organizations of all type. Usually it's a small group of people who go off to a separate room, they come back with the tablets, they say, these are the answers, the 10 commandments from on high, and people are expected to then care about them, be invested in them, try and achieve them. And, and I think the reality in human nature is we're not built that way. People own what they help create. And so finding ways for people to get their voices heard in this expectation that you're talking about, it's like, well, how do you bring that to a close? Well, people know, and at some level, it makes sense. It's common sense to say, well, we've gotten 600 people's input. Now it's time to go make it happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And then how do you, uh, how do you make sure that you know, once you do that and everything gets rolling, there's always the initial enthusiasm, isn't there? You know, everybody, oh, we ought to say this is fantastic. Let's go. And then a month or two down the line, maybe things start to wane a bit. How do you keep that ongoing engagement? So we are in the very midst of that right now in this project that I mentioned to you. We are in what's called phases four and five. Phase four is expand so that throughout the 38,000 people, they understand what this new vision is, and we have sustain. Mm -hmm. How do you get this to be sticky and something that, it's a culture integration effort, but between two companies that have merged, but the question is how do you get that new culture to stick over time? So we have multiple strategies that we have put in place and that our culture integration team has put in place. So I'll just give you a feel for some of these. Um, there's a large number of what they call craft employees. So think of these as the frontline workers. Right. Um, the, the supervisors and managers for them are all getting introduced through a one hour session. You could call it training. You could call it awareness raising. But they're given the tools to be able to lead what they call a starter session. So before they start work every day, they have these sessions to plan what they're going to do. We're working with the supervisors and managers across all 38,000 people so that they can have conversations about these values. We have a values program. So a value goes out every two months. One of the five values goes out and there's behaviors with those. And so we have a process in place so that those supervisors and managers can have a quick conversation in the morning that says, how does this behavior impact the work that we're going to do going forward? Um, senior leader messaging is another big piece of this. It's like when senior leaders get up, are they talking about these values? Um, performance appraisals. If we say these values and behaviors matter, are they getting built into those HR processes in which it really counts if you live these values? So multiple streams that we're going after simultaneously. So from a real-time strategic change standpoint or RTSC, mm -hmm. we say work on many fronts at once. And so multiple strategies is one of the keys to making this successful. Yeah, and I think it's a it's a very important point there that you hit upon. It's it's making sure that people are equipped with the tools and the knowledge to bring it bring it forward. Because there's nothing there's nothing worse than throwing a change initiative on a maybe you know a number of departments, but never training or helping that department manager in how to roll out and and reinforce change. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. When, when I started this work, we had a phase of work, an area of work that was called aligning leadership. 
And of course, that's obvious. You have to align leadership in terms of moving forward. But what we realized, and this is a lesson on myself. Now, I did learn it 20 years ago, but I did have to learn it, mm -hmm. right? Which was we shifted that to developing and aligning leadership. Because you can't expect leaders to behave in new ways in line with a new culture when they haven't learned. Mm -hmm. And so having leadership development as a, one of the central pillars of this work and saying, look, we need to understand what it looks like to behave this way. We need to understand the competencies just to be expected to behave in new ways isn't fair to anybody. It's not fair to that supervisor or manager, and it's certainly not fair to their people. So I think of it as Lucy, Charlie Brown and the football. And for people in the States, this was an old comic strip mm -hmm. that you could I remember. Charlie. And uh, Lucy would hold that football down and she would somehow get Charlie to try one more time to kick it. And when he went to kick it, she'd pull it out of the way and he'd end up on his backside. And so I think that this Lucy, Charlie Brown and the football metaphor, it fits with change because if in fact we get people really excited to do things in new ways, and then we pull the football out from right. under because they don't have the competencies to do it, it's, it's no different, which the comic strip, it's a funny comic strip mm -hmm. if you're Charlie. If you're Charlie, it's not so funny. Yeah, no, exactly. It's uh, I couldn't <laughs> agree more, and it's a great and that's a great analogy. Uh, and I think the other part is it it goes even deeper than that, right? Because if you don't give the the supervisor, the managers, the skills, right? As a supervisor and a manager, you don't want to appear like you don't know what's going on. So if you don't have the skills, then you're probably going to default to sort of going. Listen. I know it's a, I know this is an initiative that came down from on high, but it's rubbish. Don't worry about it. You don't have to worry about it, right? And then for they actually do more damage. Right. And and you know, one of the things that I found is that if you do this work right, if you aren't meaningfully engage people, not just at the surface, but you say this is something that matters and it's not going away. I mean, we have multiple strategies in place so that it reminds people, it helps people, it helps them. You know, they, there's a saying, catch people doing something right, mm -hmm. right? As opposed to catch them doing something wrong. And so what we try and do is build in as many opportunities to catch people doing something right as possible. And so those managers and supervisors, they're gonna go one way or another. They're either gonna come with you and be part of that change and make it happen, or they're gonna resist. My experience has been the greatest resistors become the greatest zealots for change when it's done well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I absolutely. And I think the other part too is that uh, is that the more you, the more you in the more you engage, especially those people who may be resistant, as you say, you can turn them into great evangelists and advocates for the program or for whatever you're trying to achieve. But if you don't, then they're going to be the, the greatest resistors too. So it, it is really, it is really down to you. So what is the, um, let's just talk about the real results part of this for a few moments before we run up against the end of our time. What are the real tangible results you've seen from a proper, well-managed change management process like the one you're outlining? Right. So, so, you know, if you're not focused on real results and real results, I put into two categories. One of them is the easy and obvious, which are business results. Mm -hmm. And you can measure those. Uh, the other is real results in terms of the culture. It is this the kind of place that I want to work. So on the Gallup survey, one of the questions they ask is, would you refer a friend to work where you do? And so that culture is just as important. But what I'm going to do is say a few things about those business results. I worked on a project in New York City on a tuberculosis control project. Um, now, this is 20 some years ago. And what they have found, right, they, there was a pending pandemic. People weren't taking their, their meds. They were getting multi-drug resistant strains of tuberculosis. So it was even harder and harder to, uh, to combat it. Uh, it involved multiple agencies with, between the prison system, the shelter system, the Office of Management and Budget, Department of Health. All these people came together, built a blueprint, and then what happened? An 83% year-over-year decline in the incidence of tuberculosis in the city of New York. Last year was the lowest incidence of tuberculosis since they started tracking it in 1897. 
So that's one example. Then I'm going to take an example very quickly from business and say that mobile in the Gulf of Mexico, they were in what they called a death spiral, mm -hmm. which meant they get less investment from corporate, which made them less competitive, which meant they got less investment. They became even less competitive and so forth down the tube into oblivion. We worked with them and within 10 months, they had a uh, return on fixed assets, which was the way that they measured improvement, went from zero to 6%. They had things where they launched new businesses in the six months that they had talked about for years, but had a profit that they could put right to the bottom line. They had a situation where they had uh, issues getting into deep water leases, which is where a lot of the new money was made. And they got money from corporate to go in and put in the first 10 months of the turnaround, they got six new deep water leases. So these are very concrete results. Um, in TJ Maxx in Europe, we did work, and the CEO in TJ Maxx, not only did they fund them, not only did they get a footprint into Europe faster than their competitors, but the CEO in the annual report actually pointed to the growth in Europe as the success of the company. So these are very hard facts and realities that you can see from a business standpoint. And if you're not pointed towards those in the game of change, I think you're missing the boat. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, well, we've uh, bumped up against the end of our time here, Jake. So before we go, I'd like you to tell people a little bit more about yourself, how they can learn more about you and get in contact with you. Sure. So again, um, Jake Jacobs, you can find me on the web at www.realtimestrategicchange.com. So that's two C's in the middle, realtimestrategicchange.com. And if you would like, I love to talk to people and help them directly. So a phone number is 310-924-7667. And so if you have a question, honest to God, this is a true statement. You call me. I will pick that phone up and we'll talk about what your situation is and how it might be improved. Yeah, and I would encourage you to do that, even if it's just to have a real human answer the phone for once. It would be a nice experience <laughs> for most of us. <laughs> Listen, Jake, this has been great. My name is John Golden, online sales magazine, uh, uh, sales pop online sales magazine, Pipeliner CRM. I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thanks so much, John.